What's up guys, welcome back to Fish of Hex. My name is Travis. Today we're doing another email Q&A. As I mentioned before, I'm trying to get as many of these videos as I can done. Uh, shooting for one per week, so hopefully you guys like them. And if you do, uh, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. Now, uh, my plan is to try to answer as many questions as I can in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And just a heads up, there is a storm going on outside, so you'll probably hear the house whistling throughout the video. So with all of that said, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, our first question comes from Prime Time Kill 90. So my 220 is four months old and I'm dosing 40 milliliters a day of both A and B two part. I want to also dose calc for all the benefits via dosing pump 12 times per day. How much should I start with 12 times at a day or per day? Uh, well, I'll give you uh, the answer you're looking for and then I'll give you my two cents. Now, uh, when it comes to dosing calc on alongside with another uh, method like two par or a calcium reactor you really have to go slow because uh, you're not only adding calcium and alkalinity from those two methods but you're also uh, going to be adding them uh, via the calc so uh, when you talk about all the benefits i'm assuming you're just talking about ph because that's really all you're going to get benefit wise from adding calc on top of two part if you really want to have benefit i would just stop both of those and go straight to a calcium reactor but either way i would start with one to two milliliters per day and dose it at night because that's going to help elevate the ph while it's starting to drop uh, during the evening so uh that's kind of the answer to that but my two cents is you should not be adding calc to a tank that's four months old um, I just feel that it's too much complexity for a system that's just that new now I have made a DIY calc reactor you guys saw that in previous videos I added it to the tank here on top of the calcium reactor for the only purpose of increasing the pH at night well it did just that it did work but I'm not afraid to admit or ashamed to admit that it just made things too complicated. It made it difficult to keep a stable alkalinity level, um, and it just wasn't as consistent as I'd like it to be. So that's why I took it off, and also somebody else needed it, so I felt better giving it to them, and then just went back to using strictly the calcium reactor. So, uh, yeah, I would not use it. I think uh, if you want to increase your pH, just connect your skimmer outside, add a refugium, maybe put an air stone or something in the sump away from the return pump, those things will help uh, increase your pH. So uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Prime time kill 90. Okay, so moving on to our next question. Hi, sorry to bug you. I wanted to get a UV sterilizer and heard good things and bad things about them. I saw your videos on your UV sterilizer and it seems like your tank, seems like in your tank, you have no side effects by using it or at least not that I can tell. Do you think they're worth running? Sorry if this topic is getting old. Uh, before I get into answering that, first thing, guys, if you're sending me emails, don't start it with sorry, don't apologize for taking up my time, you don't have to talk me up or kiss my ass, nothing like that, and uh, you know, don't apologize for any of that stuff. Just ideally, you can send me an email that says uh, weekly email Q and A. You put hi fucker as the title, and then put you know question one, make it short. Question two, keep it short. No paragraphs, nothing like that, and you can end it with fuck off. I don't care. Just don't have to apologize. You don't have to kiss my ass. Just send me the damn email. Now, uh, to answer your question is UV sterilizers are awesome. Now, for me, I only use it to clarify the water to make it look all nice. You guys talk about it all the time how the tank is crystal clear. It looks great. Well, that's because I use a UV sterilizer on top of filter socks, which is the mechanical filtration that helps get all the fine particles out of the tank. Now, for some people, they like to use UV sterilizers because they don't quarantine their fish, and they feel that it helps remove any of the parasites that it might be floating around in the water column. Yes, I'm sure it does, but that should not be your main reason behind it. So I recommend get something cheap. Don't spend a lot of money. For me, I use the Jabo 55-watt UV sterilizers, and they're, what, 100 maybe 150 bucks max, something like that. And uh, I use one of them on 500 gallons, and it works just fine. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, our next question is from Jen. Hi, Travis. I have a couple questions, and I'm hoping you can point me in the right direction. After a disastrous first attempt at the hobby, I am starting over. Listen to poor advice and tried to rush. I purchased a JBJ45 all-in-one, which should arrive any day now. I have the rock and sand ready to go, and I will be setting up a quarantine tank in the same time. Well, congrats on the new tank, and good for you for setting up a quarantine tank. The new tank will be my first exposure to any kind of sump. Previous tank had a canister filter. It comes with some media already, uh, but I am looking to see what else I can put in the back for the rest uh, for the best success. 
Uh, we'll get into that here in a second. Uh, my plan is for uh, fish initially, Blenny, Diamond Goby, Clowns, Rasses, etc. And down the road, when the tank is stable, to start some coral. I purchased a Tunzi skimmer already. Lights will be purchased in December sometime. I'm thinking of going with uh, T5 hybrid with uh, Kessels. Well, that's a good choice. Uh, that's actually a really good choice. Anything better? Anything better than that would be like a T5 uh, Radeon, in my personal opinion. But uh, yeah, that's going to work out great. I have heard that having an ATO is necessary for smaller tanks like this question mark yes you should have an ato for any size tank because it just makes life a ton easier and uh it's just one less thing you have to think about i believe the tank comes with some carbon and and a bag of ceramic rings i see i see that some people say to use marine pier pond matrix extra rock is there a good way uh that uh, to uh get started i need, i appreciate any advice i'm learning a lot by watching your videos no okay so the first part is yeah congrats on the quarantine tank and the new tank good choice i'm assuming you got ick uh, from rushing previously that made you get a quarantine tank and uh yeah when it comes to the media in the back of any all-in-one i used to if you guys remember the anemone tank i had i used to have uh, bio balls back there and uh any kind of media that you put in the back of an all-in-one is just going to collect detritus and be a nutrient factor later on. Uh, personally, I don't do anything with, um, uh, what is that, Marine Pier anymore because of the aluminum that I picked up on my ICP test. And once I removed it, it went away. And then on top of that, uh, when they get clogged and full of shit, uh, they turn into nitrate factories for sure. They're definitely a mess. And uh, so, yeah, I wouldn't put any media back there. But what I would do is uh, put uh, some mechanical filtration, like a filter sock, or I'm pretty sure they come with filter socks. I have to check. Um, or maybe a mesh or something like that to catch any kind of particles from the tank. It will kind of clear it up. Also, uh, you're going to want to put... Um, uh, what is it? Uh, you're going to want to put uh, like a, you can put a refugium back there. You can grow that. You can put one of those small little um, algae scrubbers. I've seen those in previous videos. Uh, there's other things you can put back there. I just would stay away from any kind of media or anything that you would have to move around to try to clean. Uh, you want to be able to go during your water change and just stick the hose back there and clean it with no issues. Um, I would not be messing with any kind of media so hopefully that answers your questions i'm trying to think if i missed anything uh yep no marine pier no palm matrix no extra rock in the back uh you're good to go so uh congratulations and i know this was in september you feel free to email me let me know how it turned out okay moving on to the next question which is from george he has nitrates and phosphates i don't know if it's from me or from another company but uh i started dosing it dosing the two on sunday and i noticed that the skimmer is going a little crazy is this common or am i looking for another cause um i've never heard of nitrates and phosphates causing a skimmer to go crazy um and i have the nios quantum 300 which if you even breathe on my tank it's going to piss it off and it'll start overflowing so um i wouldn't uh i don't i don't really think it's the nitrates and phosphates it's definitely not mine if that's uh, if those are the ones you're using Using. Um, I would look into other sources, maybe you overfed, maybe you're, uh, you know, maybe you didn't turn your skimmer off. Are you putting phyto in the tank? That's definitely something that will do it. Um, uh, free fuel will do it. Any kind of extra supplement or something like that could cause it to, uh, to piss off your skimmer. Also see if, um, you know, somebody put dirty hands in the tank, you got kids around, check for anything, toys or anything that might be in the sump. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons, maybe a lotion in your hands. I don't know. I don't know. They're, I'm not going to get I wasn't, I was going to go down a route there. Fuck it. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> oh, but I want to so bad. Oh, maybe you were jacking off and you didn't wash your hands enough. Okay. I said it. Oh man. I got to edit this out. All right. Our next question is from Cody G. Good morning. I wanted to ask your opinion about using a reactor with denitrification media to help remove nitrates from my tank, which is overstocked with smaller fish and they keep and to keep them in check. Tried large water, large water changes, but they are lowering phosphates at a higher rate than nitrates, causing more issues. Thank you for your time. Okay, um, so if you're having an issue like that, I would go ahead and try bio pellets. I wouldn't uh, do any kind of like dosing of uh, vodka or anything like that. Just try some bio pellets. Uh, start off slow. I have a couple videos on it, and I was pretty successful with them when I had a lot of fish in the 125. And um, just be careful because it does, I think, remove 16 to 1 ratio of nitrates to phosphates. So, uh, yeah, just start off very, very slow. And if once you get to a point where maybe you don't need them anymore, maybe some fish die off or they get eaten or whatever, when you stop using the reactor, remove some of the media slowly. That way you don't um, have an issue and have big spikes in um, nutrients and cause further problems. So uh, go ahead and try some bio pellets and go slow. And, again, I have a couple videos on the channel with that. Um, other than that, I would... Uh, I would stir, steer away from bio pellets if you possibly can. Try to go more natural, like a big refugium, consistent water changes, bigger skimmer, stuff like that. That's all stuff that I would try to do naturally before implementing any kind of bacteria. Because the problem is with bio pellets, if your power goes off and say, you know, it's off for a couple hours and you can't get any kind of flow to the uh, media, 
that media could possibly die, and then you kind of got to deal with it restarting and all the shit associated with it. So uh, just keep an eye on that. And again, check out the videos on how to set one up and connect it to your skimmer and all that good stuff. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, so let's go to move on to our next question, which is from Kim. Hi, Travis. I'm having an issue with two of my fish that are in quarantine. I've had them in there for about three weeks now, and I'm treating them with copper as I saw spots on them. The spots are getting worse in the longer that they are in there, but I don't know why. If it's ick, how can they get worse when they're in uh, the coopermine? Their fins are tatty too. I'm not sure what that means. Um, I gave them a freshwater dip the other day, which seems to help, uh, but the spots are starting to get worse at the end of the day. Please help. Any suggestions would be appreciated. For one, uh, Kim, I know that you're one of the members on the YouTube uh, community here. Uh, hit me up and let me know what you mean by fins are tatty too. I'm not really sure what that means. But, uh, okay, so the life cycle with ick. Now that you're seeing it growing on them, um, adding copper at this point to try to actively kill the ick that's on them isn't going to kill them so uh, basically the only time you can kill ick is during their swimming phase so what happens is they swim around the water you can't see them they land on the fish they bury into the uh, skin of the fish or gills or whatever or, or yeah they're sorry it goes into gills and then it uh, gets throughout the body and then it goes on and on and on but uh, anyway so it will uh, swim attach itself to the fish and then it'll go through its life cycle which means that it's going to grow on the fish. That's when you see the spots, and then uh, those spots will fall off, and then it will um, break open at the bottom of the tank after a certain amount of time, and then the whole life cycle continues over and over again. So when you see a fish that has the white spots, yes, you can add the copper. Uh, I would have put the copper in before when you first initially added the fish, maybe bypassing that whole uh, situation. But either way, uh, it's just going to take time. you got to wait it out. I would not stress the fish out anymore by taking them out and put them in freshwater dips. That stuff isn't going to do anything. Fresh Water dips are more or less used for parasites, uh, like uh, those little fluke worms and shit like that. Uh, I don't really use it for ick, because um, ick usually stays in the gills. It has to get, it has to go through its life cycle. And it, like I said, the only time you can kill the ick parasite is when it's in its swim phase. And I don't know the name off the top of my head. Somebody could probably find it. I just call it the swim phase, the crystal phase, and the annoying, ugly-looking powdered fish phase. But um, anyway, so. Just go ahead and leave the copper in, leave the fish in there, go through the two-week treatment, and at this point, I'd even extend it. Um, I would just go maybe three weeks or so and then do a 50% water change and then do a couple more weeks of observation to see if it comes back before moving them into your main display. So uh, hopefully that answers your questions. And hit me up again on the community forum. Let me know what you mean by um, their fins are tatty too. All right. Okay, moving on to our next question from Tony. Travis, I need some advice. I need to replace my 75-gallon stand as it has become very unsteady. I'm thinking about upgrading to a 90-gallon. My concern is the sand bed in the tank recycling. My current sand bed is about one year old and one inch deep, and it gets siphoned weekly or bi-weekly, I'm assuming, during your water changes. Do you think it would be wise to reuse it or purchase new sand? I don't want to harm all of my corals in the transfer, especially uh, the more sensitive SPS. Um... Okay, so when it comes to the sand beds, I mean, I, you said you're going to uh, build a new stand and upgrade. So I'm assuming if you're getting a new tank and you're getting a new stand, you can leave the 75 gallon up and running. Now, what I would do is um, during the transfer, you could take the sand out, you can put it in a bucket and you can rinse it with uh, some of the salt water that you're pulling out of uh, that 75 gallon tank. You can use some of that to just rinse it off a little bit and then you can then you can put it into the 90 gallon and then continue up, uh, you know, filling it up that way if you want. Uh, there's a couple different routes on that. You can you can either reuse it. It is only one inch, and you are siphoning it on a weekly or biweekly basis. So it's not like it's like six inches deep and it's in the back building up all that dirty, nasty, nitrifying bacteria and all that stuff. So it's not. It's a relatively clean sand bed already. So I don't see any issues with reusing it. But uh, there is no downside to buying new sand since again it's one inch deep. It does harbor some beneficial bacteria, but it's really not going to be that much given that it's so uh, shallow. So uh, it's your call on that, and uh, good luck with the new tank. All right, so our next question is from Jonathan. Hey, Travis, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for all that you do for our hobby and our community. Hey, no problem, John. So I'm just going to go ahead and get right down to it. I've been using Instant Ocean Reef Crystals for quite some time now, and I haven't had any issues, but I'm getting more serious about the hobby, and I'm looking to switch salts from uh, Instant Ocean to Fritz uh, RPM uh, Pro Salt. I have a 110 gallon and a 40 gallon mixed reef. How slowly should I go about switching from one salt to another? I'm uh, just getting tired of the inconsistent readings and parameters that I'm getting from the Instant Ocean. Okay, um, that was the same problem I had with Instant Ocean uh, reef crystals back in the day. You guys can hear that wind is fucking blowing. Um, man, it's loud. 
And uh, yeah, so I used to just have uh, inconsistent readings just like you. I had high alk in one box, uh, low alk in the other, and then I had 2,000 parts per million of magnesium a couple of times, which killed off a whole bunch of snails in the 125. And uh, when I came over to the 300, I switched to the uh, Fritz Blue Box, and I've been using it ever since. I uh, really love the salt, and I'm not just saying that because they support the channel and our reef tank builds. I'm telling you that the salt is actually really good. Now, of course, there's drama and shit online and in this community regarding Fritz and people blaming it for the fucking tanks and shit. Uh, I don't believe any of that crap. There's always other reasons. And I'll tell you right now, um, Fritz, look at the tank. Look at the 300. I got 500 freaking gallons of full SPS growing on Fritz. I do a 50-gallon water change every single month. I've never had a problem with that. And one way that you can not have any problems is just go ahead and make the salt. And if, if it's a new box, you can always test that new box and see where the alkalinity is at, the calcium and the magnesium. And if you really want to spend the money, put a freaking ICP test on it. Uh, you, do whatever. I don't care. I'm telling you right now, Fritz is a good, good salt. I have no problems. and I'm going to use it for as long as I can. I don't see any reason to switch to anything else. It's freaking 200 gallons for whatever the heck I'm paid for. I don't know what I pay for, but it's, it's good salt. And uh, I definitely recommend you use it. Now, when it comes to switching from one salt to another, just stop using the reef crystals. And your next water change, this do the same amount of water, just use different salt. Over time, it will completely uh, remove the uh, um, instant ocean from your tank, and you'll have just fritz in there. Uh, but I would save the instant ocean because you might cure rock later. You might want to set up a quarantine tank. You could always use that salt for that, and you'd be good to go. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, next question is from Arnie. How big of a tank do you recommend as a beginner to start with? A 30-gallon question mark, an all-in-one question mark. Well, uh, the bigger the tank you have, the more leeway you get when it comes to water parameters and fluctuations. So as a beginner, I recommend, hey, if you could fit a 55-gallon in your house, get a 55 because the chances are you're going to start with a tank that might be 30 or even 20 or 30 gallons or whatever. You're going to want to upgrade soon. That's just how this hobby is. I started with a 25-gallon tank and I had a 125 within the year. It's just it is what it is. So and look at me now. I got a 300 and then I got a you know a thousand coming soon. So the thing is is that uh, get as big as you can get to fit in your house. I mean, I was going to go off on a dirty tangent on it, but I'm not going to. We are running out of time. So uh, just get the biggest tank you can. All the ones are great, preferably. You know, uh, the bio cubes are pretty cool. Um, the JBJs are good. Whatever your budget fits. Um, if you can't do that, just get a biggest tank you can. You can drill it, make your own sump, save yourself some money, do whatever you want to do. Just get the biggest tank you can get, as I said about 4,000 fucking times already. Okay, we have time for about two more questions. So much for the 10 to 15 minute mark. I kind of forgot all about that but uh anyway so our next question is from jonathan and not the same jonathan a different one i have a fire fishing quarantine and it looks like its belly is sunken in do i need to treat for internal parasites question mark um at first no what you can do is try to do it more naturally by giving the fish maybe some probiotics in liquid form you can uh, feed the fish really good food don't give them pellets and dry shit and stuff like that give them some mysis shrimp give them some um what is the other food I would say give them some of mine, but I can't freaking afford to ship it to anybody. It's too damn expensive. Um, just give it some healthy food with some uh, multivitamins in it. Reef Plus, you can put that into food. It really helps. Um, but if that doesn't help the stomach full, get full or maybe the fish is shitting like white stuff, white stringy stuff, then that's an indication that there's an internal parasite that you're just not going to be able to take care of with food. And then what you want to do is you can go to a local fish store online, Amazon. You can get a meal fix. There's other types of... Um, uh, medications out there. I'm, I don't have them all on the screen here. I can't pull them all up, but um, you can just uh, try some of these internal medicines like Prazipro, stuff like that. Uh, that will help um, with the internal parasite. And there was somebody who on YouTube here who said, I forgot who it was, said that you can't treat for internal parasites. <sighs> I'm not going to call them out. I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass them too bad. That's a load of shit. Uh, because yes, you can, you just have to do it in a timely manner before the fish starves to death. Uh, but anyway, yeah, you can treat it. Just, uh, you know, try some natural methods first and then give that a week or so, and then go about, uh, getting some medication. All right. Okay. Our final question is from Brian. Hey, Travis. What's up, Brian? Uh, great YouTube videos. Please keep them coming, and thank you for your service to our country. No problem, man. Uh, I am a new reefer planning on setting up a 120-gallon tank. Uh, start with soft corals and advance to LPS as I get more experience. Watched your YouTube videos, and you convinced me the merits of quarantine. That's good. That was That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so I'm planning on setting up a quarantine tank as well. I'm not clear about how to go about quarantining corals 
and inverts though. Uh, all right, so the first question is, do you remove the plug before you you quarantine a coral or you put the uh, frag in your display tank? Uh, what you do is when corals come in on a plug, I recommend people cut off or remove the coral from the plug and then dip the coral and then put the coral on a new plug and then um, put that in your quarantine tank. Um, next question is, if you buy a couple of corals at the same time, quarantine together and find out that one had aptasia or another pest, do you toss all of them? Uh, which pest do you try to simply treat and remove uh, versus toss in a frag? Well, you shouldn't toss any coral regardless of the pest unless it's like a Montipore eating nudibranch, which then you might as well just fuck it because that's just a pain in the ass. Um, or an acropora eating flatworm. Yeah, I toss those too. But other than that, I would uh, just, you know, Aptasia can be killed with nudibranchs. It can be killed with, uh, you know, Aptasia X and stuff like that. Um, when it comes to red bugs and other parasites like that, those can be removed. Uh, it's just those two that I mentioned previously that I'd toss the coral out and toss all its freaking buddies out too. Um, but uh, anyway. So when it comes to uh, the pests and everything, just treat the one frag, but don't toss any of them in your main display until it's completely pest-free for a period of time. So my rule of thumb is, hey, maybe I get flatworms in my quarantine tank. I will treat for flatworms, and then my 60-day quarantine starts over. But that's for me because I'm running SPS and my business and all that stuff. For you, it's probably going to be like a, a you know two-week to 30-day situation. Um, but once the pest is gone, the last sign of it, that's when your quarantine period starts over. Okay, so hopefully that answers that question. Moving on to the third and final question that he has. What are you looking uh, for when you're quarantine inverts? Uh, how do you treat them and do you, uh, if you found something? And how can you stay alive? How can they stay alive and otherwise uh, pristine quarantine tank without a usual death? Um, well, when it comes to keeping inverts alive, I usually throw nori or I feed the tank a little bit of food. Not a lot because you can really destroy a quarantine tank. Um, and also don't put them in the same tank that you put your fish in because if you have copper in the system, the copper will eventually kill uh, the inverts. Even trace amounts of copper that even if you did 100% water change, the trace amounts that are in the silicone will still kill the inverts. So uh, you can give them a little bit of food, they'll be fine. And then you can put and then you, you can put like PVC and stuff in there for them to climb on. Now, when it comes to what I'm looking for, it's not so much what I'm looking for. It's what I'm what I can't see. So for that, there is like it and stuff can come in on uh, the shells and, and on uh, they can kind of live on. They can't host or be, you know, the invert or whatever can't host the ick parasite, but it can come in on them in the water and on their shells and shit. So uh, pretty much it'll go through the life cycle and you don't have to worry about it getting in your tank. Also, uh, you know, vermented snails, you can get those off the snails, uh, shells and all stuff like that. What I usually do is when inverts come in, I will take my bone cutters and I will clean them and I'll scrub them with a toothbrush, make sure they're good to go, uh, dip them in some salt water and then throw them in a quarantine tank. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about it popping up later on. So, uh, yeah, so that's about it for the video, guys. We are, what, 23 freaking minutes in. This is a long one. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. If you made it this far, give the video a thumbs up. Let me know what you think, and um, I'll see you guys later with another video. All right, peace.